very much to Young Americans for Liberty for inviting me to speak tonight. My name is Janani Stolmirov II, and today I'll be presenting my personal view in opposition to war. I consider war to be the greatest enemy of human progress. So my current view, which will seem a rather extreme view to many, <coughs> is that war is not acceptable by any parties, against any parties, for any stated or actual justification. And I will say that has not always been my view. And indeed, I was fortunate enough never to have personally experienced the horrors of war, unlike Professor Woody, who spoke to you earlier tonight. And I hope that as few people as possible get to personally experience the horrors of war in the future. But that was not always the position that I held. Indeed, when the US occupations of Afghanistan and Iraq were starting, I supported them. I supported them for many years, uh, even when they began to get bogged down and seem interminable. And I thought I had moral reasons for supporting those occupations. I thought that they were primarily undertaken in self-defense. I thought that they were directed against evil regimes or evil organizations like Al-Qaeda. I thought that as a result, the occupations could improve people's lives by reforming the governments and sometimes even the customs and societal structures in those areas. And I thought, of course, that the entities against whom these occupations were directed were moral monsters like the Taliban in Afghanistan or Osama bin Laden or Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And it is true from a standpoint of individual rights, those <coughs> entities, those organizations have committed a lot of atrocities. Uh, they have violated the lives of many innocent people. And from the standpoint of morality, I would agree they have no right to commit those atrocities. Those regimes had no right to exist. They have no right to exist. But in terms of considering what to do about it, war is perhaps the worst possible response. And I realized that in retrospect. I realized that my initial expectations regarding how the Iraq and Afghanistan wars would turn out were completely mistaken. I expected both of those wars to be very brief, very effective, and to result in minimal casualties, at least on the American side. I sought to extrapolate from the exponentially declining record of American casualties in prior wars. If you try to draw a curve between, say, the casualties in World War II, the casualties in Vietnam, the casualties in the first Persian Gulf War, I thought circa late 2002, well, if the United States tried to topple Saddam Hussein again, there would be approximately 10 casualties. And of course, that didn't turn out to be that way, not even close. And that's not to say the American military wasn't terrifyingly effective in its combat roles. Uh, the United States has by far the most powerful military in the world. <coughs> but despite military successes on the battlefield, these occupations would not end year after year. So in the face of that seeming empirical refutation of my original position, my initial interpretation was, well, from a moral standpoint, the occupations will, were still proper, but they were mismanaged. And with better leaders, with better specific decisions, perhaps they could have been done right. They could have been concluded successfully. And yet, I think the greater conceptual realization that I came to over time is some kinds of government initiatives are bound to fail based on their fundamental premises, irrespective of their particular attributes. The very pursuit of undertakings like war is self-defeating. And I will emphasize this is not an attack on one particular political party or the other. As Professor Woody pointed out, 
both Republican presidents and Democratic presidents have entangled the U.S. in numerous foreign occupations. The second Iraq war was begun by a Republican president, but essentially continued throughout the tenure of a Democratic president, and now another Republican president has inherited it, and I don't think he's going to wind it down. And furthermore, from at least some standpoints, you could say there were strong moral reasons to oppose the Taliban, to oppose Al-Qaeda, to oppose Saddam Hussein. And there was a great deal of organization. There was a great deal of tactical and strategic brilliance on the part of US military command. And in spite of all that, the occupations in Iraq and Afghanistan failed miserably. And some people might say, well, Saddam Hussein is out of power. At least that's good. The Taliban is not in charge in Afghanistan. At least that's good. But if those occupations didn't fail, why are they still continuing? Why is the United States continuing to embroil its personnel, its resources, and its very political stability in perpetuating these conflicts? So as with many fundamental shifts in worldview, they don't occur overnight. Uh, they occur as responses to an accumulation of evidence. And one large factor in eventually tipping the scales and shifting my position was the 2008 presidential campaign of Ron Paul. And I was a college student at the time. I was attracted to Ron Paul's campaign for a variety of reasons. I liked his economic policy. I liked his support of domestic individual civil liberties. I liked his general erudition and civility and intellectualism. And I didn't always see eye to eye on him. And I supported him in spite of his views on foreign policy. But I tried to give those views a fair hearing because I was impressed by the overall presentation of Ron Paul's ideas. So I tried to engage those views and try to understand his arguments and subject them to an empirical test. I thought, well, perhaps those occupations with some justification should be given a chance to be successfully concluded, kind of the peace with honor viewpoint. So my empirical test was, certainly by early 2009, there would have been more than enough time for those occupations to have been successfully concluded if there was ever a chance for them to be successfully concluded. So my empirical test was if they didn't successfully wind down by early 2009, then it would be time to cut our losses, admit failure, and withdraw, instead of just sending in more good money after bad and wasting more infinitely valuable human lives. However, as you know, US troops are still in Afghanistan and Iraq. So clearly, by that empirical test, those occupations also failed miserably. And then in late 2009, I saw the collateral murder video uh, that was released by WikiLeaks through the large information leak uh, that was made possible by Chelsea Manning. And that video really shook me because it dispelled any illusions I had about American moral exceptionalism in war. That's not to say that the American military is uniquely horrible in some way. It's just that there could no longer be any pretense that the American military was immune from, uh, from committing the kinds of atrocities that have been ubiquitously committed by all armies throughout human history. And that's not to say most soldiers are evil people or ill-intentioned people, quite the contrary. But you are going to have those bad apples. You are going to have people who not only kill innocents and regret it or try to justify it as unfortunate but necessary collateral damage, you are going to have some people who gleefully rejoice at the murder of innocents. And when you have a war, that behavior is going to be enabled, and in some respects, it's going to be unstoppable. And that is a type of moral transgression that I could never bring myself to tolerate. So that brings up a key question in this entire discussion, the question of intention versus reality. What does war actually accomplish, as opposed to what 
it is desired that war accomplish. Common justifications for wars are many-fold. They include retaliation against aggression, deposition of evil regimes, justified claim to a territory or resources or a perceived justified claim, or retribution for past wrongs, whether real or subjectively perceived. <coughs> and yet, for all of those abstract justifications that some people can articulate, the actual consequences of war are concrete suffering. And indeed, in practice, wars are fought among innocent young people to fulfill the geopolitical fantasies of a small group of deluded old people. Certainly not the vast majority of old people who are just as powerless as the young people, but a few who are in the political elite who have the ability to send hundreds of thousands or millions of young people to their deaths. And the tragic part of it is the combatants in a war on opposite sides might have been good friends in any other context. There's no reason why a random young person from the United States shouldn't befriend a random young person from Syria or Afghanistan or Iraq. And it's a sheer tragedy that war forces them to shoot at one another. And also civilians on both sides of a war suffer. Even if they avoid the most direct consequences like a war destroying their neighborhoods or depriving them of their relatives, they still have to sacrifice resources that rightfully should belong to them. We will be bearing the economic burdens of the Iraq and Afghanistan <coughs> occupations for decades to come. And war is an immense hindrance to the material progress of human civilization. All of those roads and bridges that get destroyed, all of those habitable buildings that are no longer habitable, factories that can no longer produce goods for human beings to enjoy. What art is not created because of a war? What scientific research is not conducted because a war is underway? How far back in time would you like to be taken because a war destroys your immediate surroundings? It could be 50 years, it could be 100 years or more. An entire city is leveled to the ground and people in that area have to start over rebuilding that city. That could take decades or centuries for that area to return to its former prominence and vibrant, vibrancy. So the innocent suffer most in war. In the meantime, the politicians are seldom themselves adversely affected. Often they're even benefited if in a time of crisis they can posture as the champions of the people, rally them to their <coughs> side, say that they are uh, advancing some great cause or protecting some great ideal. Wars ostensibly are a response to transgressions by national leaders like Saddam Hussein or Bashar al-Assad. But in practice, they harm the very people whom those leaders also oppress. Think about ordinary Iraqi civilians or ordinary Syrian civilians. They probably suffered as much from the US occupations and US military interventions as they did from the tyrannies of Saddam Hussein and Bashar al-Assad. And I think a fairer way, a more justified way, if two national leaders have a problem with one another, is to have them fight it out personally. Or if they fear an imbalance of physical strength, uh, well, perhaps Donald Trump uh, shouldn't be in the same ring with Bashar al-Assad. I don't think that would uh, end very well. They could designate champions to uh, es essentially contest whatever issues are at stake and leave the ordinary civilian population out of it. I think from a standpoint of moral justice, there should be ways for oppressive regimes to get their comeuppance, but war is a terrible way of achieving that. I even think economic sanctions are a terrible way of achieving that because they again harm the ordinary people who also suffer from those regimes. So eliminating evil regimes is not a question of war. It's not a matter among peoples or countries. Probably the best way is to facilitate general civilizational progress, economic and philosophical progress, that leads the people in those areas to themselves depose those regimes. And furthermore, I would say it's any person's right to defend their own lives and their own property if 
some Syrian individual whose family had been murdered by Bashar al-Assad decided to assassinate him, I wouldn't terribly mind. But it is not the job of the U.S. government or the U.S. military to undertake that type of effort. Desiderius Erasmus was a great late 15th century, early 16th century Renaissance humanist philosopher, and he wrote an excellent essay that I would recommend to you called Antipolemus, or The Plea of Reason, Religion, and Humanity Against War. I'd like to read an excerpt from this essay, though. I do encourage you to locate it online. It's freely available, and it is quite affecting prose. Erasmus wrote, Peace is at once the mother and the nurse of all that is good for man. War, on a sudden, and at one stroke, overwhelms, extinguishes, abolishes whatever is cheerful, whatever is happy and beautiful, and pours a foul torrent of disasters on the life of mortals. Peace shines upon human affairs like the vernal sun. The fields are cultivated, the gardens bloom. The cattle are fed upon a thousand hills. New buildings arise, riches flow, pleasures smile. Humanity and charity increase. Arts and manufacturers feel the genial warmth of encouragement, and the gains of the poor are more plentiful. But no sooner does the storm of war begin to lower than what a deluge of miseries and misfortune seizes, inundates, and overwhelms all things within the sphere of its action. The flocks are scattered, the harvests trampled, the husbandmen butchered, villas and villages burnt, cities and states that have been ages rising to their flourishing state, subverted by the fury of one tempest, the storm of war. So much easier is the task of doing harm than of doing good, of destroying than of building up. And when I read these words, I think not much has changed conceptually about the harms of war. Perhaps the technology of war is even more destructive today on an even more massive scale. But what Erasmus wrote about is universally true about war. It's true about everyone. And if you think about how much easier it is to destroy than to build up, think of Aleppo in Syria, which for millennia was a cultural center, a center of arts, a center of commerce, and now it's a smoldering ruin because of war. There are no good sides in a war. There are no good sides in the conflict <coughs> in Syria. And I would caution anyone against the temptation to try to abstractly justify a war, because war is concrete suffering. And it's concrete suffering that can be illustrated in concrete figures. Even as far back as March 2013, the Watson Institute for International Studies at Brown University estimated the cost of the Iraq War up to that point to be $1.7 trillion. They also estimated that by 2053, if you consider all of the ongoing costs, including the costs, for instance, of medical care, rehabilitation for the veterans that were affected, those costs would rise to $6 trillion. Now, on the other hand, in Mountain View, California, there is a biogerontologist named Aubrey de Grey, uh, who has an initiative called SENS, Strategies for Engineered Negligible Senescence. And he has essentially identified the seven principal causes of damage to human cells that accumulates over time with biological age. He has stated publicly that if he were to receive between 30 to 100 million dollars of funding per year for the next 20 years, he would have about a 50% probability of achieving what is called longevity escape velocity, where in the future, because of medical advances, life expectancies will advance by more than one year with each year that passes. So for, let's take that $100 million estimate, the upper end of his range, multiplied by 20 years, you have $2 billion. $2 billion to have a 50% chance of achieving potentially indefinite lifespans versus $6 trillion, which is what the United States is going to incur in terms of the costs of the Iraq war. For one three thousand of the cost of a single war, we could be extending human lifespans indefinitely rather than needlessly destroying human lives. That is the absurdity of war. And that is the absurdity of the misdirection of resources 
that war implies. And there are so many other better priorities. Biomedical research of all sorts, curing diseases, uh, enabling better prosthetics, uh, space colonization. The cost of that would be in the many billions of dollars rather than millions of dollars, but still a lot lower than the Iraq war ended up costing. Domestic infrastructure. In many areas of the country, we do have failing roads and bridges. Wouldn't it be better to fix them, to provide something useful for people to uh, employ in their day-to-day -day lives, rather than destroying infrastructure far away? Autonomous and electric vehicles. Developing more of those could save tens of thousands of lives per year in the United States alone that are lost due to human error causing automobile crashes. And electric vehicles, as Professor Woody pointed out, could reduce the United States' dependence on foreign oil and might reduce the incentive to engage in future foreign occupations. 3D printing technologies, which could uh, create a wide array of goods from uh, everyday consumer goods, uh, from, say, a tabletop 3D printer, to even entire houses. There are startups in various countries now that are experimenting and have successfully been able to create prototypes of 3D printed housing. Why not invest in building up rather than destroying? I would say the best policy solution going forward would be to institute major cuts to defense spending, use the resulting savings to pay off the national debt, after that, tax rates could be lowered dramatically. All those resources that are being wasted in war right now could be returned to the people who could use it to catalyze economic and technological progress. And I'll also note with regard to Syria in particular, because this is a looming conflict, we do not know how exactly President Trump is going to react uh, when he perceives the next provocation from any of the many sides in that conflict. There are no good sides. It's true, Bashar al-Assad is a murderer, irrespective of whether he is responsible for one particular chemical attack or conventional attack. Uh, he has the blood of a lot of innocent civilians on his hands. But the same can be said of the al-Nusra Front, which is an al-Qaeda-affiliated group, certainly of ISIS, and of the so-called Free Syrian Army, which is uh, somewhere between a myth and an agglomeration of ragtag warlord groups that appropriate, uh, appropriate that, that label in order to get funding from the United States and other Western governments. But look up the Free Syrian Army on Wikipedia because there's a nice section there about atrocities committed by that group or in the name of that group. For instance, on March 20th, 2012, Human Rights Watch issued an open letter to the Syrian opposition, including the Free Syrian Army, accusing them of carrying out kidnappings, torture, and executions, and calling on them to halt these unlawful practices. The FSA has been accused of summarily executing numerous prisoners whom it claimed to be government soldiers. A rebel commander in Damascus had said that over the months his unit had executed perhaps 150 people whom his military council found to be informers. That's some due process for you. Also, uh, the Daoud Battalion, operating in the Jabal al zawiya area, has reportedly used captured soldiers in proxy bombings. This involved tying the captured soldier into a car loaded with explosives and forcing him to drive to an army checkpoint where the explosives would be remotely detonated. So, in essence, the United States and other Western governments have been funding these military groups that use involuntary suicide bombers to accomplish their political objectives. And this is being done at great geopolitical risk, at risk of escalating tensions with Russia, because the Putin regime, for whatever reasons, might align itself with different sides. Such an escalation of tensions is dangerous from the standpoint of the survival of human civilization because a misunderstanding in a moment of mutual suspicion and heightened conflict could lead to nuclear war. It has happened many times during the Cold War 
that humankind was on the brink of a nuclear confrontation, and it was only because cooler heads were able to prevail and make a decision to uh, draw back from the brink of that that we are still alive today. And I wonder, though, in the future, will there be cooler heads to make that decision, or will a different decision be made? So with that being said, I will be open for questions. One interesting question that uh, I'd be happy to take if anybody wants to ask me this is, what about the extreme case if our country is invaded by a foreign army? If, like in that video you saw, uh, there are foreign troops in Texas, is war justified then? But I'll leave it to you to decide how you want to approach this subject and uh, what you would like to inquire about. Yes. Yes, so I'm, I'm going to take the bait. Okay. Yes, sort of. So, uh, do you think World War II would be justifiable? Justifiable because those two countries did have the capability of taking over essentially the entire world. Okay. So. And those were clearly evil yeah. regimes that killed millions of people. Absolutely, they were clearly evil regimes. I would say they were the product of prior ill-fated interventionist decisions as well. One could think about what might have happened had Woodrow Wilson kept his promise to keep the US out of World War I. And then perhaps World War I would have drawn to a stalemate. There would have been no Treaty of Versailles. There would have been some more equitable settlement. Uh, perhaps there wouldn't have been the kinds of grounds for resentment in Germany that got Hitler into power. Uh, but suffice it to say, uh, from any given standpoint, we have to make a decision based on how history has turned out uh, up to that time. And I would say, in the extreme case, if there's an invasion by a foreign army, if there are literally troops marching down the streets, pillaging, uh, taking lives, destroying property, self-defense is a right. Uh, if somebody shows up at your doorstep and, and says, we want to take everything that belongs to you, uh, you do have the moral right to defend yourself. I just question whether it should be done through a centralized organization that forces people to die on command. And there could be a resistance that doesn't rise to the level of war. Uh, the government of the occupied country could target the leaders. Uh, I would have no problem with the, United, the occupied United States, uh, the government, uh, let's say, organizing a team of commandos to try to infiltrate Adolf Hitler's compound and assassinate him. In fact, there were several failed assassination attempts uh, on Hitler's life among the German high command. So uh, it was clearly at least a conceivable tactic to deploy. And furthermore, uh, even in the case of an invasion, the rank and file troops are typically just following orders. There are a few sadists among them, and if they do try to interfere with your life, of course, you have the right to fight back. However, the real problem wears a suit or a uniform and sits in a palace somewhere. So my suggestion is keep civilians out of intergovernmental squabbles altogether. Even if you're organizing a resistance, leave the resistance to the professionals. Uh, people would have the right to band together in self-defense. But it wouldn't be this concept of a war between nations or between peoples. One of the uh, greatest tragedies of modernity is this concept of total war, the idea that it's not just King X versus King Y uh, trying to battle it out for territory or prestige or whatnot. It's the German people versus the French people, and somehow their patriotism, their pride, their national identity are entangled in this, and they don't have to be. Uh, there's this kind of downward spiral where people try to use escalating means in order to win at all costs. So in a sense, I'm advocating a return to more of a code of rules-based engagement, a kind of restraint where you could have two champions have a stylized fight. And in our age, it might even be an electronic combat of some sort. And all sides agree this resolves the geopolitical crisis. We will go no further. We will acquiesce to the demands of the winning side. Now, can there be enough uh, restraint and enough recognition that that is a more optimal outcome than using any means necessary? 
as that's an open question, but I think that's why we're having these discussions. And I would say also an important consideration is only very few people can actually fight well. Most of us are quite terrible at it. And armies turn people into cannon fodder, in essence. Uh, they turn people into disposable pawns that go somewhere on the battlefield on command and might have to be sacrificed for uh, a kind of larger tactical or strategic purpose. That's not right, even if you're in your own country defending a, what you perceive to be your homeland or your community. Why should you be in a position where you're risking your very well-being? If you value your life, of course, you should try to preserve that which you value, but not at the cost of itself. So that would be my answer. It's not a clear-cut answer in the sense that I'm not going to tell you how to defeat Hitler if he were to invade this country. Uh, but I, I think if we figured that out, we wouldn't be having that discussion. Uh, but my broader answer is there are better ways and worse ways of doing that. Yes? So, kind of like what I asked Woody was, um, how do you get people to kind of understand um, this threat abroad when it's not here? But um, it is here in a way, um, because uh, we've actually had to give up many civil liberties due to the war uh, in the Middle East, and, and, and always through wars that we've had in history. Um, so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that, kind of shed some light on liberties that we have lost, and like how, how the government has become more involved in our lives because of the war. I remember what it was like to fly on an airplane before September 11, 2001. I remember that it was a relatively unobtrusive experience from the standpoint of, yeah, you went through a metal detector, uh, somebody would uh, put your bags through an x-ray machine. Generally, there was nothing else. And no questions asked, no scrutiny of you as a potential criminal or terrorist, which is, from a statistical standpoint, quite ridiculous to screen everybody when a small minority of people are even remotely inclined towards such criminal acts. And I also remember an era before mass surveillance of everybody's communications, before the chilling effect that that has had when essentially if you digest the disclosures that Edward Snowden made in 2013. Every email you send, everything you type into most search engines, every social media post you make, you should really structure it with a little inkling in the back of your head that, yes, the NSA could be uh, somehow processing it, maybe not directly looking at what you wrote, uh, but feeding it through some sort of algorithm, and if it generates uh, the wrong frequency of keywords that is somehow associated with the keywords used by nefarious individuals, you might be flagged for further scrutiny. That can have a chilling effect. That can have a chilling effect on what you choose to do with your life, on what you choose to disclose to other people. And I would say the mentality that exists is very disproportionate in terms of its focus on the real risks. So you are a lot likelier to die in an automobile accident and far likelier to die of, say, cancer or heart disease or, <coughs> if you live long enough, Alzheimer's disease than you are of a terrorist attack. You are likelier to die of a lightning strike or falling out of your bed in the morning than you are of a terrorist attack. Yet, because of all of this incessant focus on the crimes of a small number of people, uh, I would say the damage those crimes have done to the mindset of Americans and how they approach everyday life has been a, even out of proportion with the damage that those crimes have done to actual American lives. And, uh, when people say, uh, essentially, we cannot sacrifice our liberties or else the terrorists have won, uh, that is essentially what I believe has happened, unfortunately, to uh, America's civic culture. There's a a kind of fortress mentality now, in essence, that anybody potentially could be a terrorist unless we subject them to extreme vetting. And uh, let's say, uh, taking the situation of Syrian refugees, if 
there is even the remotest probability that one out of 100,000 Syrian refugees could do something nefarious if we allow them into the country, we should just ban them. We should uh, prevent them from entering the United States altogether, even if they've been vetted for months, even if uh, they've already obtained visas uh, in many cases, even if they've just assisted American troops in overseas conflicts. And that type of uh, truly paranoid mentality makes no sense to me. But uh, I would say the climate of war abroad creates this idea <coughs> of perpetual war footing. And I don't know when it's going to proceed, but I think it's time to start working on individual minds to shift away from that mentality. Yes? Another thing I was going to say, I brought up Chelsea Manning, and so did you. Uh, I don't think everybody knows what that was, so I don't know if you wanted to elaborate yes. on that. So Chelsea Manning used to be Bradley Manning at the time, and uh, she was a private in uh, essentially U.S. intelligence services. Uh, she had contact with information, classified information, including video footage about Afghanistan and Iraq in particular. And a lot of the major WikiLeaks releases uh, circa late 2009 and 2010 were from Bradley and later Chelsea Manning. Uh, and it was interesting because Chelsea Manning uh, had a conversation, an online chat, with a hacker named Adrian Lamo, and she uh, essentially was saying, well, how would you feel if you knew about all of these horrible atrocities and you couldn't say anything? Uh, what would you do? And uh, in the course of that conversation, she confessed that she was uh, the leaker to WikiLeaks. And Adrian Lamo ended up essentially uh, being a mole for the U.S. government. So uh, essentially they had her confession. She was in the United States. Uh, she was court-martialed. And uh, she was essentially sentenced to indefinite detention until Obama pardoned her uh, shortly before leaving office. And the collateral murder video that I'm referring to was a particular incident uh, during the latter years of the Iraq occupation, I think it happened circa 2007, uh, where essentially, uh, essentially there were American pilots uh, overlooking a scene where there were several journalists and they were carrying camera equipment and they thought, ah, there are some militants, let's kill them, uh, let's shoot them, and they were laughing about it. And then a van came by to try to help these people as uh, they were struggling and that van uh, essentially had a father who was taking his children to school. And they shot at that van too, uh, and they were gleeful about it, and uh, they killed and injured many people in that van. So that video, it was a direct display of how, uh, let's say, not every soldier on the battlefield, even when fighting for an ostensibly just cause, is going to uh, have complete restraint and complete righteous motives. Uh, I really did think for a while that American troops were bound by strict rules of engagement, and those rules of engagement were you don't intentionally kill civilians, uh, at least not without knowing exactly what it is you're doing, exactly who the targets are, and uh, saying that you regret the collateral damage. Of course, that was a rather naive view of mine at the time, but I think the collateral murder video really drove home the point that there is no such thing as American exceptionalism. If I just like to comment, you guys can all watch that video on YouTube at any time, and it's no explanation really does it justice um, until you see it with your own eyes. The kind of carelessness they use to murder innocent civilians, and I mean, careless and then remorseless. And it's and even if they were hurting soldiers, they acted like they were just squashing bugs, and it was it, it's really disturbing. I think everybody should watch it just to kind of understand that. So thank you. Certainly. Yes. Um, I just wanted to know your opinion about intervention in regards to humanitarian crises. And the one in particular I'm thinking of is the Ugandan genocide. Yes. And famously they had a lack of intervention, which resulted in hundreds of thousands of deaths. Well, I wonder to what extent military intervention in particular could have prevented those deaths. I mean, admittedly, it's a very tragic crisis. And there are circumstances when ethnic or nationalist hatreds 
escalate to the point where there's just this widespread slaughter and chaos. I'm not sure what having a few troops on the ground could have done to thwart that. If you had 10 people with guns, they might have been overwhelmed. If you had 100,000 people with guns, they might have been doing the overwhelming and in the chaos of it all uh, might have crushed many innocent people uh, as well as uh, perhaps the potential or actual perpetrators of the violence. Uh, so again, these occupations bring unintended consequences. Uh, and one could, one could give examples of particular circumstances in which soldiers occupying a foreign country have done some good, like saved some civilians from gunfire by insurgents, or even on a macro scale, toppled the dictator. I just don't think on balance that ever justifies the loss of innocent lives and the completely counterproductive consequences that set back human civilization. Now, I'm all for humanitarian assistance, peaceful humanitarian assistance. Uh, it's just there are many better ways of doing it than uh, sending in men with guns. Now, one very libertarian policy would be open borders. If people want to flee from uh, those kinds of genocides, those kinds of oppressive regimes, let them in, especially if they want to live peacefully, they specifically want to escape that type of horror. There should be some sympathy with that. Uh, if they're thinking the way we're thinking, they want to be here, they want to be productive, they want to contribute to our way of life, a great deal. Yes. Um, <clears throat> a couple specific things. First of all, the open borders would mean that, that all wars are where things are to be taken, which would mean that um, countries with assets would be ground zero, which wouldn't be so good for us. <laughs> the, um, <clears throat> that's what it's going to end up with. Uh, the Second World War is, is a terrible example of, of anything without a whole lot of research because what people who were there and people who lived through it, people who were around shortly after that, what they knew of it, which admittedly was uh, missed an awful lot of the story, is completely different than what we've been brainwashed ever since. Even all that all the documentation we have, photographs and all that, and mislabeled different victims, or they were created in processes that started completely after the, the war supposedly ended, and again, they were different victims. Uh, it, it's worth studying because the parallels between Central Europe and, and America today are beyond terrifying. The, um, I, the, we spent more than an hour and a half saying the war was bad, and this was an international conclusion that everybody agreed, at least since uh, the, the end of the First World War. As a matter of fact, war was outlawed since then. Uh, what, what's happened since then is basically now we, we have a world where the, the people who want war have to stage false flags to get it. They have to stage false flags to get everything, all the social controls they want within countries. The, um, the, as a matter of fact, the, the world cannot be governed by the people who are governing it now without false flags. The, um, uh, the, the first time that it was obvious that no, it can never be ruled that way again was at the, the World Trade Conference in Seattle in, in 1999. The, here we, this was staged in, in the middle of a country where the, 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 the middle class at that point had already been almost overwhelmingly just disemboweled. And people were unhappy about that. They had 40,000 protesters who shut down the whole city. And the delegates couldn't get in the building. It was totally ungovernable from the uh, point of view of uh, uh, the ruling elite. And shortly after that, we had 9-11 to take away the freedom to protest. The, um, the, so there was this necessity to imitate, the, to, to intimidate 
the population became the first pillar of necessity of false flags. The second pillar of, of necessity of false flags is to defend the capital dollar at all costs. You can see the consequences of that. Uh, the, the, the third absolute pillar of necessity for to govern the world by false flags is the um, um, the this this concept of the, the increasing burden of government and democracy in order to corral public opinion to ever greater costs and burdens and and pretexts for, for governing everything. And pretext is basically it's a lie that came out of law enforcement that okay you're questioning someone you want to get information out of them, you want to give them a hard time, you just want to intimidate them. So you make up a story of how they did something terrible, and then you uh, challenge them with it. First you say they're lying, and if it proves they're not lying, then you say that they're, uh, uh, they must be, or first you say they're doing something criminal, and if they, if they can prove they're not doing something criminal, then they must be lying. And if they're not lying, they must be crazy. And, and basically, all, pretty much all our societies run that way right now. There, there are only, we talk about old people sending young people to war. But if you think about all the, the old, older people you know, older people, the people, you, from wherever you were to begin with, the older you get, the more reticent you tend to be towards war. There's a small group of people who are basically at war with the rest of humanity. They're born into it. It's, it's, it's a large part of it's just absolute hatred and we're serving their purposes but again the only way that we can serve their purposes is through false pretexts so that the idea is not discovering a war is bad the idea is discovering how do we get around the, 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 the false flags well you mentioned uh, many points I'll respond to a few of them uh, I'll take the briefer ones first Open borders doesn't mean letting in criminals or militant groups. It's letting in anybody who is peaceful, and it doesn't preclude domestic law enforcement. Like uh, today, a police officer can arrest you if you commit theft, or if you commit murder, or if you commit a white collar crime. That would apply to any immigrant who comes into this country for any reason with any security system or no security system at all at the border. Uh, with regard to World War II, I agree that there was a lot of propaganda at that time within the Allied countries as well. Uh, in fact, Franklin Roosevelt uh, had to institute policies to suppress domestic dissent, uh, modeled after the propaganda initiatives of Woodrow Wilson, whom he greatly admired. Roosevelt was Assistant Secretary uh, of the Navy during World War I, and he wanted to emulate that propaganda apparatus, even during times of peace, during the New Deal. Uh, and he certainly deployed that uh, in World War II as well. Uh, that's a, I do think Hitler was a lot worse than Roosevelt. Uh, and I do think that somebody would have had a right of self-defense uh, against Hitler. Now, my family comes from Belarus. Belarus uh, is uh, formerly a Soviet country. It was on the front lines of the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union. And essentially a quarter of the population was destroyed by Hitler's invasion. But the <coughs> Russian high command had essentially a cannon fodder oriented strategy. Send waves and waves of people at the German army and get them mowed down. But enough of them will make it and enough of them will overwhelm the Germans. And as a result of this recklessness, this absolute recklessness, they probably sacrificed more of their own people than uh, Hitler could have deliberately intended to kill. So if I were in that position, if I were a resident of Belarus or Western Russia in 1941 or 1942, my choice would have been to flee to Siberia if I could uh, have found a way to escape uh, the very severe retribution that uh, the Stalinist regime had in place for alleged deserters or even people who wavered. Stalin actually 
deploy men with machine guns at the back of the lines of Russian troops that were sent forward to attack the German positions, just in a frontal attack, but if the troops fled, they'd be mowed down by the machine guns from the rear. Uh, so that's a really terrible place to be. Uh, that, that's not you standing up for your homeland uh, and somehow fighting off an aggressor in a justified war. That's you being coerced to die in command. So that's one reason why I don't think that resistance strategy is effective at all. Uh, now, what you said with regard to false flags, there have been some of them in U.S. history, the sinking uh, of the USS Maine. Uh, at least, I think it happened as an accident based on uh, all of the historical evidence, but the framing of the Spanish government uh, that led to the Spanish-American War of 1898 was a deliberate, uh, you could say, false flag attempt. A lot of the time, these kinds of events are just convenient justifications. Uh, in my view, the September 11th terrorist attacks were definitely real terrorist acts perpetrated by Al-Qaeda. There's no question about that. Were they a convenient justification for certain policies that would have been implemented anyway if there were another sufficiently, uh, let's say, momentous event to justify them? Probably. Uh, but I would also say Governments don't have as tight of a control as any theory of a top-down conspiracy would imply. Uh, we've seen in the recent election, uh, there is, let's say, no better connected political establishment than the one that backed Hillary Clinton for president, and yet she lost. She lost despite having an overwhelming fundraising advantage over Donald Trump. And I am... I am by no means a fan or a supporter of Trump uh, either, uh, because I think Trump plays on uh, some of the worst tendencies in the American public. But it shows that an elite group of politicians doesn't really have as much control as they think they do. They have certain levers they can push, uh, but the world is a lot more complex than that. And that gives us an opening. It gives us an opening with the ordinary tools that we have as ordinary people to try to change public opinion, and with that, try to change policy. And sometimes you have genuinely decent people in power. Uh, Eisenhower is a good example. I don't agree with all of his policies, but I think uh, he was of a sober mind with regard to war, probably because he saw it in great detail and he understood what war entailed and he tried to warn the American people. So, okay, so guys, just, just so you know, we got uh, we're going a, a bit over, but we can maybe do two more. Yeah, and there, then I want to hear from people who haven't spoken, and then he'll he'll take you'll take questions after. Yeah, him. absolutely. There was a question in the back. Uh, did you still have a question? Uh, I was just. Uh, uh, yeah, you. No, it was already answered with. Uh, I was I was a train to our civil liberties yeah. as well. Is that uh, it's it's justifiable by all these uh, these. Uh, politicians in power that hey there's this there's this terrorist attack happening and obviously our civil liberties must be sacrificed for the greater good and again I was just gonna say like that all ties back to uh, what's it saying that you always say uh, good intentions leave oh yeah the road to hell is paid with good intentions right yeah. so that was just basically what I was gonna add it to. But I can certainly agree with that now you had a question so open borders, wouldn't that not be such a good thing? I mean, you're letting people in for safety, but what about the people who can't afford to come over? So shouldn't we help them over in their country to make it a safer place for them instead of accepting them to the United States? Well, I, I would say in many cases it is difficult, if not impossible, to achieve some sort of uh, universal abstract conception of justice. Ideally, we'd want all people to have clean drinking water, yet there's a large fraction, already a minority, but a large fraction of the world's population that doesn't have access to that. And there's a lot of historical path dependency that has to go into that, but uh, I'm very skeptical of attempts to centrally re-engineer that. Now, it's one thing to say, if you know of a particular family in Syria or in Sudan or in the Congo that needs help and you want to 
send your resources to help them or sponsor an aid organization that wants to do that, or even sponsor their arrival in the United States for whatever reason. Maybe they have skills, uh, and maybe you're an employer who wants to hire them. Uh, that's one way to exercise that kind of benevolence. But it needs to be done on a case-by-case -case basis by the people who know, as uh, the great Austrian economist Friedrich Hayek would put it, the circumstances of time and place. Because if you try to impose an overarching centralized framework on that, there are bound to be unintended consequences and some people's lives may be ruined. Again, if you're focused on something particular, if you think that uh, deploying a 100,000 man strong <coughs> army is going to help family X from Syria escape being slaughtered, you might be right. But uh, what about families Y, Z, A, B, C, D, E, and F? What will happen to them? So I think with that kind of caution in mind, more targeted efforts by individuals or voluntary groups to help other individuals are more effective. Yes, you had a question. Um, what would you say, uh, sorry, what responsibility do you think mass media bears for this current crisis that we're involved in? I would say mass media often, uh, let's say, are lazy and they can regurgitate talking points uh, from anybody with an agenda. And it, it could be a situation where even they want to seem impartial. So uh, they say, well, side X says this, but side Y says something different. And there could be an overwhelming weight of evidence in favor of one side or the other or neither side. But there's this perception, oh, uh, we just we need to give equal time to everybody. So uh, you could uh, envision a situation where uh, the proponents of foreign intervention X bring up this whole host of reasons. And then there, there are some who oppose it. And we've seen that coverage, say, in the wake of the Second Gulf War, where uh, the media were saying, well, uh, Colin Powell just gave this speech before the United Nations where he laid out the case that uh, the, the regime of Saddam Hussein has all these weapons of mass destruction, now, some people disagree. There are protests in the streets. They say uh, no blood for oil, etc. But there, there's this temptation to just regurgitate rather than critically evaluate, rather than say, okay, this is what the evidence actually suggests in this. And although Colin Powell made this case, there are reasons to be skeptical. If the media had done that, I think we might be in a different place right now with regard to the Iraq act. Um, I was wondering, because America, the majority of America's uh, uh, philosophy on foreign, foreign policy was isolationism, um, I, I, w I was wondering whether the change, the change from isolationism to, to a more interventionist foreign policy was in part due to uh, presidents or leaders lacking the, how I say, the experiences of actually being in the war. I mean, you have earlier in American history, in the 19th century, <coughs> I'm sorry, those people like Washington, Andrew Jackson, and Tyler, who actually had experiences fighting for the United States, and they knew their atrocities of war. But then you get into the early 20th century, where you have, you have as many uh, presidents who were experienced in that or uh, or do they trust you going well into the 20th century you you have people who have absolutely no experience in, in war. So I want to hear your opinion about that. It's interesting that you bring that up because there's at least a strong correlation with regard to the claim that you're trying to make. Even some of the earlier wars in American history, say the groundwork for the war of 1812 uh, even though it happened during the term of uh, James Madison, was most likely laid by, of all people, Thomas Jefferson, who really should have known better, especially when he imposed his embargo of 1807, which essentially prohibited the United States from trading with the rest of the world. Uh, talk about extreme 
extreme protectionism uh, by which any subsequent trade policy pales in comparison. Uh, some of the most uh, cataclysmic wars in American history were indeed uh, fought during the tenures of civilian presidents. Abraham Lincoln was an attorney. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, Franklin Roosevelt was a career politician in essence, but uh, upper class elite New Yorker. Uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, was also a career politician. Uh, on the other hand, uh, yes, you can, you can think of uh, military generals who became presidents who generally didn't wage destructive wars. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower ended the Korean War, uh, for instance. And uh, there, there are many other examples. Ulysses Grant didn't start any wars. Uh, Zachary Taylor didn't start any wars, though he was a hero of the Mexican War. Uh, so there's a correlation. I, I don't think that's a necessity, though, for uh, an individual to have direct experience in war in order to understand that war is bad. Uh, as the great French 19th century classical economist Frédéric Bastiat wrote, there are two great teachers in life, experience and foresight. And one would hope uh, to have the benefit of the latter because the former is a lot harsher. So. I would say probably the ex-military presidents learned a lot from their experience. But we would hope that in the future, especially if uh, we achieve our goal of making wars a lot less frequent, those future presidents will have the benefit of foresight, as well as the lessons of history. I want to make one quick comment. The, you studied a lot of stuff going on in the war, and the humanitarian issues. And very commendable. Uh, and I know you absolutely mean, totally mean really well and all that. You're still scratching the surface. And because of that, if I was to refute all the things you said in response, just to explain what it was, it would take days or weeks. But you said one thing that got real close to reality, and I just wanted to respond to that. And that was when you were talking about the, the, the battle lines going through Belarus. The, the Soviet army always was two armies. There was the, 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 the Slavic people, which would include the pop, basically the population of Belarus, which was the front line army. And then there was a, a behind the line army of the people who actually ran the Soviet Union, who were not Slavs. The, um, every, from, from their point of view, from the point of view of, the, of Stalin and, and his command, all the all the civilian population, including women and children, were in the same category as the frontline army, and he fought the war accordingly. Uh, the scary thing is, those same people who were making those decisions and running things that way uh, were also uh, key decision makers in the, in the Nazi uh, government and uh, the other European governments that were at war. And the same group is in control of our government now leading to, over and over again, in, in one form or another, the same results? Well, I would disagree that they're the same group, that they're affiliated Study in some it. ways. I'd say there's a dynamic of power whereby the worst tend to rise to the top, especially in more authoritarian structures, in structures that involve greater regimentation, uh, a greater degree of government power over the economy and over individual lives. And uh, it's uh, essentially a vicious form of competition where the more brutal you are, the fewer scruples you have, the more readily you eliminate your rivals, the likelier it is that you rise to the top. That's why in uh, every major revolution, the revolution might start with idealists who genuinely want a better world and want to overthrow a suboptimal regime, replace it with something more just. But in uh, completely, let's say, disturbing the conventional restraints that exist in that society, the rules of engagement by which you can't say, uh, I'll designate a champion, you designate a champion, they'll fight it out, or they'll talk it out, and that will be the solution to our problems. If those norms are eroded, you get this progressive increase in the lengths to which people are willing to go, the amount of violence they're willing to increase, until the worst of the worst gets to the top. And that's your Hitler, 
for your Stalin. I don't think we're there yet in the United States. Uh, for all of the uh, absurdities and sometimes the horrific suggestions that Donald Trump has made, uh, I don't think he's nearly at that level yet. And there are still a lot of civil institutions of American society, as well as other branches of government, that can keep him in check. And ourselves. We can still speak out, and we, public opinion, are also a societal norm that can prevent the erosion of other norms. So that would be my response to you. All right, let's get around. Thank you so much for coming in. Uh, for all of our speakers, um, uh, Woody's not here right now, but Andrew's still here, so there's one more for everybody. Thanks guys for sticking around. This is mostly Young Americans for Liberty here.